Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. This is Match Day, and uh, with us today is, uh, besides myself, Vince, and Ian, uh, is Rusty Oglesby, and Rusty is a United Soccer Coaches Board member, so we have to be really nice to him today. And then um, second is, uh, most importantly, he's a high school teacher, and he's also a high school coach. So this one is hopefully geared towards high school coaches, and Rusty, first off, thank you so much for coming on. And, and he is uh, in, you know, rubbing in and a little bit for us mid people in the mid best because we can't get outside like you are right now. So right. it's 69 degrees and beautiful right now. It's I'll right. take it all day. Fantastic. Fantastic. So uh, a little bit about yourself. You're a high school teacher and maybe yeah. just go from there. and We can talk yeah, about absolutely. absolutely. So, uh, it's my 21st year in coaching and teaching in the state of Texas. Uh, was a public school employee and coach for 18, almost 19 of those years. Uh, took a year off and worked on just my real estate and kind of building a little, a uh, little bit of my finance background and everything like that. And then uh, got back into it uh, one year as a part-time head coach while I continued to to work uh, in real estate. And then the last two years full-time at John Paul II High School, big Catholic school in Plano. So I've kind of get to experience the public side and now the private side of everything, and it's it's just been really awesome to kind of be a part of both sides of the world, I guess you could say. There's so many differences, and yet there's a few uh, uh, things that really run parallel and work together. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, it's good. That's great. Um, and we were sharing earlier that, that you know, I too, you know, I was a high school teacher as well and a high school coach. So what you do, I mean, I can empathize and, and uh, relate to because uh, we're, you know, but we're also in this time right now where, Sure. It is unprecedented. Sure. Uh, we, we we've never taught online, you know, like this before. And some coaches, like for example, in Texas, the public schools, if I if I'm right, they're in season now, but the private schools are finished. Correct. That's correct. We so the private schools play like a split season, October through December, then take a little bit off, and then come back January through February. Public schools actually start playing in the end of December and play through the first or second week of April, just kind of depending on how it all works itself out. So uh, unfortunately for the public schools, they were within three to four games of finishing their, their regular season um, and getting ready for the playoffs. Actually last Friday would have been opening night for playoffs, I think. So we have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, anxious people sitting there. My wife is sitting upstairs listening right now. My wife's a at Keller High School, and they're having a fantastic season, and they don't know if they're going to finish second or fourth or if they'll ever put the boots back on and finish. So it's a very right. trying time for those guys right now. Yeah, and, and, you know, I live in Indiana. doesn't make me a bad person, but, you know, I there right now they start in the fall, boys and girls. So for now it's still kind of just continue, right, like normal. Um, but – you know, there, there's a question on the message board, by the way, on the chat room by from Zach. And he just says he's curious to see if and how coaches, you know, are they continuing the learning process when they're away from their players. Right. Uh, and preparing them for a shortened season. And, and you know, so um, so when they when we come out of the crisis, I mean, what are we going to do? So like, yeah, maybe, maybe some answers to Zach or. Yeah, I, I think, uh, man, it's so crazy. Right. I mean, this stuff keeps you up at night. Right. You're trying to. Because here's the first question you have to ask yourself, and this is the conversation I have. We have a group of guys I, I, I've been friends with for 20 years, and we're having a little happy hour the other night on the Zoom like everybody else in the world, I think, right now. And the, the comment was not so much can you finish the season. It is right now what is – is it proper to finish the season, right? You've gone along and you've played for these two, three months, and you've got your kids fit, and you hope they're coming back fit. But in reality, yeah, what is that like? Number one, mentally, for a kid to come back and throw him on a pitch and say, "Hey, go win the soccer game and get ready for the playoffs," because we're going to try to win seven games within a month and a half and try to win a state championship. Yep, is that logical? Is that really the safest, yeah. most important thing for the child? I mean, at what point do we as coaches have to step back and say, "Maybe this is more for my ego than it is for our children"? But at the same time, like my wife's team's got fourteen to fifteen seniors sitting there, uh-huh. and this has become their life, right? And so. Why is it fair to not give those guys the opportunity? So there's a lot of things that you have to go through this process and ask yourself, where does that balance fall, right? Um, so it's a scary time. There, there's no doubt about that. Uh, I, I would say, you know, you, you definitely have to treat your, your soccer program, especially if you're in season right now. I've given my guys a little more time off because I know they're doing a lot of e-learning. We're finished with our season, so 
I don't yeah. want to pressure my guys to do a lot of things. I'm trying to let them finish their semester on that, on the academic side. But the guys that are in season right now, you do have to prepare because if, if, the, if the school's open on May 4th, there's still a, a month left in school. I almost guarantee they're going to try to squeeze something in. So how does that work? Can you, can you reach out to your kids? You've got to stay in contact. What are you as a coach doing to prepare yourself mentally um, and emotionally for what that's going to look like? Because it's going to be draining. It's going to be like nothing you've ever experienced. Right. Um, and you almost all become a club coach, right? And what I mean by that is you don't see your kids. Suddenly they show up. you got to go play games. <laughs> you got to squeeze this all in. It's going to end up being like a club tournament when it's all said and done where you coach five, six games in a week perhaps. And that's obviously not great on the child's body. Sometimes people making choices above us don't take that stuff into consideration either. So uh, you, you've got to walk a fine line with what that balance is and, and have your message ready. Your staff's message better be prepared and ready for what these kids need to hear when they because they're looking to you for answers. One hundred percent. Right. Yeah. Um, we talked prior to coming on about, you know, marketing your high school program and marketing yourself as a high school coach, which for whatever. I mean, I. Look, I love high school soccer. I was a high school teacher and coach myself. That's how I started. Um, I can get on my soapbox a little bit. I mean, it's rare that you see kids cry and weep at the end of a club season. Correct. But but when a senior season, when, when a senior is done with their high school playing career, and I'm sure, for, and I know for college as well, they weep. You it's know, cool. it is it is passionate. It and, is grieving process. I've tried yeah. to explain that to people before. Um, and, and, and I tell you what I've said, before, I used to say a long time ago, there was only one team that didn't cry at the end of the season. Um, then luckily I was fortunate enough to win a game like that and win a state championship. And guess what? We cried like babies. So it, right. it doesn't end right. That it's an emotional expense that when a kid totally invests into that um, nothing else matches it, right. The, yeah. the high school and collegiate experience, Whatever right, wrong, or indifferent anybody wants to have about all those different scenarios, I don't care who you are out there. Um, there's people in the in U.S. soccer right now that won state championships in high school. So, right, you know, right. don't get us started on all that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day, they've all they've all shed tears at some point too because they're sure, so absolutely. Yeah, and I'm not again. I'm, I didn't mean anything negative to club soccer. Yeah, yeah no, but I, I, know that. I can tell you right now, in my opinion if we as high school coaches right now aren't working with club coaches right now, we've go. got a major problem in society. And that's going to be hard because there's a lot of high school guys that don't want to swallow their pride and deal with it. Cause you know that there's going to be a lot of club coaches that don't want to swallow their pride either. Right. We, we live in a very divided community, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I think it's better today than it's ever been. Um, I think seeing clubs come back out of the Academy and go back into ECNL progress so that they don't have to lose kids back and forth is a huge stepping stone for what we're starting to see. Now we're starting to see a shift back into what does it look like? And I can tell you right now, um, when things go, I, I think I said this earlier to events, this is almost for lack of better words, a social cleansing we're experiencing in America today. Um, I hate that it's happened. I would give anything for not one person to have died through this. Right, right. You are right now. You have to look at everything as an opportunity. And the opportunity today is to be what a high school is. And that's a community based educational platform that brings people together in an environment that they can't experience anywhere else. Yeah. So for the first time in many, many years, the only choice a kid may have is to play for that jersey that has the high school crest on it. <laughs> and it means something and has been there for 40 years or 50 years or 60 yeah. years who's seen years and years of success. Yeah. And, and so for the first time, we're seeing this opportunity for us as high school coaches to be that magnet that draws kids back into the love of the game for the purity of it. Because for so long, they've just been told, go do this and come back and show up and play here. Or, yeah, go play high school and come back to us where it really matters. And you're not having that. Let's face it. We're going to see a 30 to 40 percent perhaps decline in the club population throughout the United States simply because financially clubs yeah. can't sustain themselves right now. I hate that. Right. Because yeah. to be honest, you don't win a state championship in high school soccer if you don't have club players. Let's just cut to the bull. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, the best players play club and very, very seldom can you find a high level athlete that can contribute at a high level on a championship team unless they play outside of their high school sport. That's just the reality of life, okay? So acknowledging that, now what if that kid had been playing for one of those clubs that falls apart? Right. Now, high school coaches, are you prepared to do what that club coach has been doing? Are you prepared to double your efforts down and teach the basics 
teach the mental side, the psychological, the physical, the emotional, everything. Follow all the – are you prepared to do that? Because we get real easy sometimes, I think, in high school of where they're getting some of that training over here, and when they show up, all I got to do is put it together and go win games, and that's gone. We're fixing to have to right. take ourselves into a whole new mentality. I was on a call yesterday with an incredible company, IntelliGym, that's put together – I think they were at United Soccer Coaches Convention this last year, and they put together an incredible platform of mental training for athletes, for soccer athletes, that's – it's very much like a video game, but in some ways it's designed so that you can see what's happening on the pitch and try to make decisions and increase that cognitive ability to move the ball quicker and make a decision quicker and everything. So that theoretically, when you get back on the pitch after all of this is over with, you can step out there and recognize everything you saw in a video game and those those neurons are connecting and everything. And now you see the game differently, right? right. Than you're used to seeing. So, you know, th those guys are trying to help out. So the, right now, my biggest deal for a high school coach is, are you doing something besides sitting on your end, bitching and complaining that nobody's doing anything and that all these people are making things happen without you or nobody's asking me about how many games we're going to play or we're going to get to play again. And you're all mad because you're egocentric. You're no different than a club coach sometimes. And so my question to you as a high school coach is, are you doing what you're called to do? Because high school coaching is a call. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. If you're in it for anything more than a calling this, you're, you're ridiculous. Not a single one of you high school coaches out there making any kind of money that you want to write home to mom about. <laughs> the joy of today is if you're a high school coach, right, and you're, you're an educator and you're full time, hey, you're getting paid. So yeah. the way I see it is while you're getting paid to be at home, take that time to learn something, get yourself better, and then be ready when these kids come back to you so that you're continually ready to go and move. And that's going to raise that bar for you just so much more as a coach. Absolutely. And thanks for sharing that uh, company. I'll try and – what's the name of it? Intelligent? Intelligent. Intelligent. Yeah. Intel, uh, I'm, I'm going to try not to uh, – um, T-Y-M. It is. It is. It. But yeah. uh, so hopefully somebody but uh, can, can do it. So yeah, yeah. Um, this is great and very candid, which is wonderful. And um, because – I can feel your passion through the screen. And it's, oh, it's, I'm telling you, everything. And, and, me everything, right? I mean, for so long, it almost became all my identity. And I've had to take yeah. a step back. It's been awesome. And uh, we, we just have a new baby at the house. And so it, this, this little social cleansing I was speaking of has been wonderful. I get to stay at home with a three-month-old and see things <laughs> I never thought I'd get to see. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't negate the fact that we're seeing this, right? I'm watching my wife sit here and have Zoom calls yesterday, and their kids are asking, are we going to get to play again? Yeah. Wow, what a passion the kids have, right? We think sometimes kids get bored with it, and they don't want to play, or are we doing the right thing? And when you get 14, 15, 16 kids on a video conference, and they're sitting there going, please, just tell me we're playing again. Yeah. Man, yeah. you got to stay passionate as a coach. How can you not? You're dealing with the child. How wonderful is that? Right. Bless yeah. This is the most blessed – uh, group in the world to be a high school coach. Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, I mean, you, you can make sure every day, every day, if you do it right, that no kid walks around with a hole in their heart. Oh, yeah. You do it right. And, well, and yeah, we were talking about that before the deal, right? I mean, and this is, it goes without saying, but let's face it, with high schools being closed, thank God they're trying to get some food. But you're talking about kids who are go who, who wake up every morning. Some kids wake up every morning and they're really happy to go to school because maybe that day they didn't get psychologically abused or physically abused. Yeah. Or they got two meals. They got a breakfast and a lunch, right? Yeah. And so they didn't have to worry about going hungry that day. Yeah. Or they go through all that thing, and they're all they're waiting for is two thirty in the afternoon when they get to go to soccer practice. Yeah. And then for an hour and a half, they get to be a child, and they don't have to worry about anything else in the world. I think we minimalize what we really have as an impact on our kids and what our role truly is, which is not even about soccer. It's can you be that loving person in their life? Can you be that person that's going to change them? And no offense to any club. I know there's great club coaches who do that. I've got friends that are incredible club coaches that will actually sit a kid if they're not passing a class or different things like that. Yep, yep. But at the end of the day, the reality is we have to be different. We are called to be educators and proprietors of a child's soul on the soccer field. And okay. how can we not do that if we're not doing it and taking care of ourselves and getting ourselves mentally prepared to take care of these kids? Yeah, and J Jamie Bartlett just put on – High school coaching is more relational, and I, I yeah. but yeah, you know, like you said though, I mean, I've seen a lot of really, really outstanding club coaches and clubs, oh, absolutely, around the country that do it right too. Absolutely, and, you know, they care more about they, they coach the person first than the than yeah. the 
Sorry. And I, can't, I can't speak for anything outside of Texas, but I know that's been a huge push for us. You know, I was talk, we talk about TASCO in, in Texas, the Texas Association of Soccer Coaches. But I think we do a great job with TASCO of really trying to push. Can we get our club coaches involved with high school? And how do you how can you work together? Reach out. I mean, it's like I said, it's a little swallowing of the pride. But at the same time, if we're all in it for the kid, yeah. it doesn't matter. Right. It's professional with professional. So reach out and have those conversations. And we're seeing a much better give and take back and forth. Um, where kid, and it, you know, again, we may have a kid who plays defense on his club team coming and need to play striker on his offense. We're making a holistic crowd now. We're doing some different things. Right, an opportunity to be seen by other coaches and different things to move on to the next level. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's just incredible when you can really bridge that gap between a high school and a club coach and have, you know, high school coaches going to club games and watching to see because I want to know what a kid looks like on another pitch. Does he play differently for somebody else or? That club coach may reach that kid better than me, and I want to know what that guy's doing to make that person a better player. And so um, it's really awesome to go to, you know, be coaching in my high school game and turn around. There's four or five club coaches sitting there, and they're talking and laughing and having a great time watching it. So we're seeing that in Texas, and I, I, I know it's not that way throughout the entire United States, but I, I really encourage people to really start bridging those gaps. Yeah. Yep. No, this is great. Logan says you're speaking the truth, preacher, so they keep going. Um, so, Coach Barker, do you have uh – any, any questions? Uh, there is a yeah. Well, a couple of shout outs and observations first, and then maybe a question. Um, so the club discussion, I think, is fascinating. I had a young coach here um, a couple of years into high school coaching, and I suggested he reached out to all the clubs that his players represented yes. and invite the club coaches to come to the high school and watch. Yes. And I think you could do it the other way around. He didn't get a 100% response, but the clubs that he reached out to, they love him way above you know their normal relationship with the high school environment so sure. somewhere in there we've got to break that relation you know we've got to break that that barrier and it could be the high school coach reaching out checking where all of his or her kids come from and then reaching out to the clubs and saying just to let you know what we're doing with your kid this year if sure. you want to come check it out um i'm going to give a shout out to michelle from austin college the kangaroos of austin college oh, yeah. no Houston. we got college coaches on here who are, and, and Michelle talks about it, how excited she is about high school soccer because it's so primary in mm -hmm. her recruiting. Um, I have to really shout out to Tasco because what's fantastic in Texas is that to coach in the public schools, as Rusty was explaining to me, you've got to be a teacher. So now you've got educators who are committed to their communities. They've probably got their own family in that school district. It's so powerful because we see a lot of places around the country where the high school coaches are a little bit more mercenary. It's like something they do when they're not coaching. Sure. Club. So I love that about Texas. And the Tasco show, which happens the week before Thanksgiving, right. is the second biggest attended event that I coach at. So we do our convention in January. I do one in Connecticut with Ray Reed uh, and, and formerly uh, or previously Tony DeChico. For that Tasco event, I've coached it in Galveston. I've coached it in San Antonio. Superb. Yeah. Um, real quick, your high school, uh, you're in the middle of your season. Um, right. or public. In Kansas, they, they honored, even though the season had not started, they honored, the public schools honored the financial contracts of the coaches. Sure. In, in Texas, what's the situation in regards to have you been paid up? Are you halfway through? What's going on? Great question. Uh, so let's talk. There's two sides to it. So we have the public school side. So as a full time employee of a public school, uh, you're on a you're on a 10 month contract that's paid over 12 months. So even though everybody's sent home, um, even if they don't ever put their uniforms back on, um, our public school coaches are full time educators. So they're being paid throughout the summer all the way through. Now, there could be some attrition that it comes because of a school district needing to um, make some choices or somebody might retire and they might not rehire for that position. I can't guarantee all of that. But um, we are very safe in Texas. We have a wonderful education. I'm going to say we have a wonderful education system. I'm sure there's people out there that, that would differ in, in every state. But I, I, I can speak for that, that public set, setting right now. I'm a full-time educator in a private school, and I'm under the same category. I still get paid as we're going through this process. Um, so I feel really confident. Um, the where it might get a little tough is if you're a part-time employee at a private school. Um, I think you're going to see some attrition and drop off of some of that where you might have had a staff of 10 that might that drop down to eight or if you're in a football group or if you're a staff of four right. might drop to two or they might pull some money out of there to move it to allocate, you know, from other resources. 
Um, but I feel very comfortable with where we are. And that's because of the setup that we have, which is that to be a coach in Texas, you have to be a full-time educator. Um, so you're, you're actually tied to an educational piece and your coaching stipend goes on top of that. So you're paid based on your, your large sum of money comes onto uh, what you are as a teacher. And then anything you do coaching is extra and it's just divided up over the months. If that makes yeah. sense. Yep. And thank you. And then just another shout out for Tasco. Uh, we talked about this earlier before, you know, we got, we went live from what I understand, they, they do two games a week. That's it. Right. Unless yeah. there are certain. Yeah. yeah. So inter university interscholastic league is kind of like our NCAA, if that makes sense. We have a governing body. Um, private school has taps and they have a governing body that rules over and, and but in Texas, we make it a, a rule where you, you can only play two games a week and okay. basically what that, and you can't play during the, the week. So what I'm saying is, Public schools play either Monday or Tuesday, and then they can't play again until Friday. You can't play Monday and Wednesday in a public school. Perfect. And I just want that gap. So you have to have a three to four day gap in between each of those games um, to, to really try to give you the opportunity to let kids, you know, psychologically and physically, you know, respond before each of those contests. Yeah. So we, we talked about that's not the situation, for example, in Indiana, where, you know, here um, you can. I mean, basically, at the end of the day, the ADs just want to get the schedules done, and so it's off their plate. Sure. And they don't care if there's three or four games in a week. But, you know, we, there's a voice that high school coaches, I think, have and can can have with the National Federation of High Schools. 100%. And that, you know, they we can, we can make a difference. And, and, you know, one of the reasons we I think indirectly that the DA was born in the mid 2000s was because the knock on high school soccer oh, that 100%. That there's there's yeah. no like uh you know periodization idea in, in other words they they weren't limiting games or whatever it's just oh, sure axing the kids and the the quality was was whatever because the kids were tired or fatigued but i think so getting to my point we have an advocacy group a high school advocacy group fantastic group Yep. Fantastic. Yep. And if, if we can just share about that. Absolutely. Maybe maybe this group can get something more uniform. Absolutely. Like yeah. soccer should one be our biggest, biggest, for high school. One of our, one of our biggest pushes um, from day one with the Advocacy Council, with the high school group on the Advocacy Council, has been how do we uniform the game throughout the United States of America? Right? You got Florida has got a blue card and three whistles blowing at the same time. Anybody can blow a whistle. Don't even get me started. We can ask Greg Winkler about that. He's he's always been complaining. Or, or we go up to, uh, you know, some other state and it's the clock runs up and in Texas, the clock goes down. And one state's got 45 minutes and one's got 40 minutes. And why can't we just play the freaking game the way it's designed to be played, right? So one of the reasons we lose some credibility, I think, is you got a U19 player playing a 45-minute clock with stoppage time and come to high school and you knock five minutes off per half. And you stop the whistle, the game doesn't look the same. So the huge push we've had through the council is to work to, I mean, we've got all of these other initiatives, but we want the game to look the same. And Howard Putterman and Greg Winkler now are running that, that council group, and they are just phenomenal. If you have never had an opportunity to talk to those guys, they sent out an incredible letter this last week, just really trying to ease the hearts of the high school coaches throughout the United States. And they're just fantastic at what they do. I was up there with those guys and kind of was running the show, but the reality was those two guys did all the legwork. I got lucky and got the credit, I think. But at the end of the day, those two guys, yeah. they are the mouths and the eyes and the ears of the United States high school soccer and just wow. do a fantastic job. And so I encourage all high school coaches to get involved. Number one, get involved at your state level. One of our goals on the, on the council was to identify all the state associations, the presidents of the state associations. If you have an association that's struggling and you need help, reach out to TASCO. They have... We rewrote the bylaws back in 2010 to basically mimic United Soccer Coaches bylaws. So you're safe. You're protected. You understand how to do everything. There's a there's a template out there for you to build your organizations. And then after you do that, get involved in the advocacy council. We're looking for people. We need a diverse group. We need every color. We need every ethnicity. We need every background. We need large schools. We need small schools. We need them on the West Coast and the East Coast. We need you to be a part of that because the larger that voice is, when we walk into the NFHS office with our concerns and our demands, is the only way it's going to get changed. Right. right. Yep. Absolutely. So thank you for sharing that. And for those that are on this webinar, you're more than welcome to reach out to Rusty and I, and we can forward. You know, if you want to get involved in that, in the advocacy group and, and send our group, uh, get involved, we're more than happy just to, 
you know, share that information with all of you. But yeah, and, and what um, I would say too, if you if you go to United Soccer Coaches onto the website and you get into advocacy, Lee Gerald is the big time voice through all the advocacy. So Lee and and Sue Ryan are the two. If you can't re if you don't want to reach out to me, feel free to go onto the website, send an email to Lee, and I promise you, Lee will get you and will get you plugged in. She is a bulldog at ad at advocacy. She will take care of it. She is. Um, she's wonderful. Um, hey, by the way, we're like ten minutes over time, but you're killing it. You got fifty six people. We got fifty six people. You're like on the Mount Rushmore of match day yeah. webinars. Hey, I'm I'm here as long as look. I'm a, guess what? I had nothing to do, right? So you can talk to me as long as you want to. It's what what else am I gonna do? I I'm gonna have another cup of coffee in my U.S. United Soccer Coaches Coffee Cup, right? <laughs> Go so yeah, I, I wanted to just add something real quick because people clearly wanted to stay on because we haven't lost anybody. Um, you know, in England right now, there's a big discussion about whether Liverpool should be given the, the Premier League title because it's nine games left, whether they have to play behind closed doors and then they would finally win it after 30 years but with nobody there. And, you know, previously, Rusty, you were talking about those high school kids that may never get to play their last game of high school now or go to the state championship. And I think that's something that we as educators and coaches, we need to think about, you know, for the, some of our freshmen, sophomores, juniors, they're going to they're gonna get another opportunity, but our seniors might not. And yesterday, one of our sports psychologists was talking to Vince and I, and he talked about kids and helping them with a challenge mentality as opposed to a threat mentality. So as educators, it's up to us to try to find the opportunities and the challenges here for our kids not exactly. not sort of um, feel like not add to the, the tension and the threat right. and the panic. Like the biggest problem we have in American society today with our youth is anxiety, right? Let's just be honest. Mental health, we talk about it all the time, is a problem, but we don't talk about it. So one of the biggest keys that we have right now is how can we help our children with the mental health aspect of what we're trying to deal with today? So we have to be unified in that voice. I think that's where a huge part of our, our deal with high school coaches, is we get to have that opportunity to reach out to kids and just try to make them feel at ease, right? Hey, guess what? At the end of the day, as much as I want to go win a state championship or those 16 kids want to go do it and all these different things, they've got, you've got to strip it down to those kids of guys, you're still trying to get into college. What's more important, the next step of your life, right? Or if you're going into whatever Avenue that is. So let's, we got to reframe what that is, pull that anxiety out. They already have the anxiety of, gosh, I was, I mean, one of the biggest deals in Texas was we're going to have state testing. Or are we not going to have state testing? How's that going to look? Kids were freaking out. Teachers were freaking out. <laughs> but when we start stripping it down, it's how can we ease all those tensions, right? I love the game of soccer. It's the most important thing that's happened in my coaching career through all my years. But today, is it that important? I don't know if that makes sense. And that's hard to say from my I mean, people go, but you get paid to do this. And like, yeah, but you know what I get paid to do also is make sure that for seven hours a day, those kids have a safe environment and that, that they're taken care of and they're, they're, they're loved on. Yep. And they're taught about everything else that goes way beyond those white lines that we, we freaking play in for 90 minutes, right? So I think the biggest thing that we have to do, our biggest challenge is can we strip that anxiety down? Can we reframe it into a focal point of, hey, look at what's next in your life? Right. I mean, at the end of the day, yes, I remember the guys I played high school soccer with. Do I know where they are today? Maybe two. Right. So let's strip it down to the real basic sense of it's very individualistic at the end of the day. Right. Every kid that's not playing today has a reason that they want to be playing. Now, we can all say it's for a state championship, but when only one team wins it, what about those other? In Texas, 256 schools at the largest level start the playoffs. I mean, seriously. So let's let's be honest. The odds of you winning at all are not that great. So what are we going to do? What's that next step? So that's where our role becomes very important, in my opinion, is what are we going to do with those kids when the next step in their life occurs? Can we teach them to deal with the adversity today so that when they face the real adversities in life, right, yeah. when they're dealing with, can I let my mom, my mom lives with me, can I let my mom go to the grocery store today? Is it safe for my mom to go to the grocery store? Jesus, that's so much more important than a damn ball in the back of the day. You get what I'm saying? So, yeah. I, you know, yeah, I, I agree. Right at the end of the day, you can treat Liverpool and those guys however you want to. They're getting paid millions and millions of dollars. I just really don't care anymore, you know. And I'm a God mighty. I've been waiting for 30 years to see Liverpool win the cup, too. I'm going crazy. But I guarantee you, <laughs> if you handed them the trophy today, there will be some people publicly say certain things. But back at home, those guys are going, well, we deserved it anyway. And they're going to go get their millions and go on to next year. 
So we have to work with these kids to really help them understand where our priorities really lie. And if we can do that as adults, you'll find that that anxiety decreases with our children and, and therefore we're helping their mental health through the whole process. Thank you very much for that. And thank you for your time. Um, we're just going to wrap it up here, but you know, two things. Yeah. Every kid's a limited edition, right? Right. I mean, every kid, they're all unique. Yeah. And at the end of the day as as high school coaches, you, we're teaching life lessons. We're just using a, a sports strategy to do it, you know, and, and if you do it right. And I just want to say, thank you so much for your time. This was absolutely wonderful and very powerful. It is going to be recorded for those that uh, missed it. So I, I'll go get that up as soon as we can. And I uh, just want to give, again, a big thank you to Coach uh, so much for your time. And, You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, I hope, you know, everybody gets back on the fields again, like, every, you know, like everywhere else in the country. Uh, but and then I also want to plug the, the 3 o'clock Central, uh, 4 Eastern time uh, webinar, which will have uh, – Yes, uh, Supernit, Supernit, Coach, uh, Supernal, 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 Super. I just call her Tess and and Ian's boss. So, uh, but we're going to be talking about resume development and tips for resumes. So hey, right now, how important is that? Right? I mean, seriously, yeah. you, you got guys out there probably haven't touched a resume in twenty years or so, and tomorrow are going to wake up with no job. So. Mm -hmm. right. Uh, I, I encourage everybody that's out there, anyone to be involved in that opportunity to, to learn a little bit more because whew. Yes, and she, she's I'm, wonderful. She's yeah. wonderful. So thank you all so much for your time. And Rusty, thank you. God bless. And uh, thank you all for having me on here. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Okay.